And also, what's our purpose in life? How can we know any of these things? A God of Abraham, a God of Moses, a God of Jesus. Who are you talking about? How may we know this God? Who is this God related to? Allah ordered Muhammad, peace be upon him, call, say to them, he is Allah alone without any partners. This is of the most important facets of Islam. Islam, like any precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Let's explore the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes. And for the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about one of the many beautiful facets of Islam. This particular facet is simple. Simple, that's the facet. And that's how simple it is. We're going to be talking about the simplicity and straightforwardness of the presentation of Islam itself. Let's begin by discovering what the word means. It's an Arabic word, so it's proper then to go to the Arabic dictionary and look it up and say, what is this word? Where does it come from? What does this mean? The simple understanding is that it comes from a root, sa la ma. And when it reaches this perfected state of Islam, it has so many beautiful words in it. Surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace. And all of these together imply a relationship between two entities, one being the dominant and the other being the one subjugated. The one is the master and the one is the slave. Because when there is surrender and submission and obedience, and of course sincerity and peace, it implies immediately the simple relationship between the creator and that which he has created. We can easily test it with a simple formula. Is this the relationship between Almighty God and the universe. According to Islam, yes. All of creation submits to the owner, to the creator and the sustainer. Everything, the sun, the moon, the earth, the mountains, rivers, streams, trees, flowers, bees, birds, all are in submission and obedience to the one creator. That's the meaning of the word. It's as simple as that. What's really beautiful too is the concept, the simple understanding of who the God is. God is one. No discussion is really needed. We don't have to sit and argue or discuss or go into lengths of how to prove that this or that we just say one. God, Allah, is one. That's very simple. A child can understand it. A simple person can understand it. God is one. His will is to be obeyed. And if you do so, then you're doing Islam. In the Arabic language, the one who performs the action or the verb would be the mu Islam because unlike English which uses the two letters ER at the end of a verb to give the indication of who's performing it like walk er talk er think er stink er <laughs> you see that you have this suffix, er. In Arabia, you have a prefix 
before the action to show you who's doing it. And likewise, if someone is doing Islam, he's a mu Islam, Muslim, the one who recognizes that there really is one God and they want to do God's will, obeying him, then they are a mu Islam. Another simple and beautiful point about this facet is that it is for all times. It means then from the very beginning, this would still be applicable. Adam could easily be called a Muslim because he recognized there's one God and he tried to do what God wanted him to do. That would then indicate that each and every one of all of the prophets were simply doing God's will, communicating a message to their people and showing them what it was that the God, the one God, wanted them to do. So, in this way, we would say each of them were Muslim. Istislam, Tasliman, all of these words coming from the same root. Surrender, give up, do what he wants you to do. Very simple message. Now, we've spoken a little bit about the word and what comes from it. We've talked about the creation being in this condition and also that each one of us could easily be a Muslim. Even if you don't know Arabic, even if you've never heard of the Quran, maybe somebody never heard of Muhammad, although today that's highly unlikely, it's still... If that would be the situation, all that counts is this. He knows everything. He knows what's in the heart of every single soul because he created them. Therefore, whoever recognizes there must be a God and I want to do what he wants me to do, and they try their best, they could be considered as one who has understood this simple message and is in the will of God as a Mu-Islam, Muslim. Some of the other beautiful, simple facets come immediately after this because we recognize that it's impossible to consider any other way to be correct because if there is a God and if he has a will and if he has something that he wants done, then it's only logical that his way would be the only way. His way is the only acceptable way. Therefore, whatever he wants, this should be what we would want as well. We wouldn't need to make up something. In fact, it wouldn't be simple anymore. If we begin to make things complex and make it difficult, we would be getting away from the very essence of the beauty of this whole word, this Islam, which, by the way, also gives this connotation of being complete and whole. Simple, isn't it? It makes you feel like, why didn't I think of that before? It is so simple. The beauty of this deen or way of Islam is that it's so simple. No matter what the condition of the person is, he could still be in Islam. Let us take, for instance, some of the actions that are required of the Muslim. First is to pronounce their belief in God. A Muslim needs to declare, I bear witness, there's none to worship except Almighty God, and I bear witness to the prophet who brought me the message, which at the time of Abraham would have been Abraham. At the time of Moses, it would have been Moses. At the time of Jesus the Christ, then obviously it would have been him. And at the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and those who follow after, then of course that would be their prophet. So they would say, Ashadu la ilaha illallah. I bear witness that there's none to worship except Allah. Wa ashadu Muhammadin abduhu rasul. And I bear witness Muhammad is his servant and his messenger to me. The next thing after that is to perform what's called salawat, the prayers, the ritualistic standing, bowing, prostrating sitting and praying toward a certain direction. But what if the person didn't know the direction? Would that mean then that he couldn't pray? 
And if he didn't pray, then would he still be a Muslim? Well, in the case of the direction, he takes his best educated guess and performs his prayer. There's another requirement, though. He's supposed to wash before he prays. What if there's no water available? And we know from Islam that it's simple, that he can use a little talc or dust and just dust his hands, his face, and perform his prayers because it's very simple, very simple. I stay away from the word easy, though, because I remember when I first came to Islam, some of the Muslims told me how easy is Islam. <laughs> I said, well, it may be simple, but I'm not going to say easy because definitely along the way there are going to be things that arise that cause a person to have to work, to do things, and experience things, and that's all a part of Islam. But if a person understands that the beauty here is the simplicity, all he has to do is as much as he can do, and that's all that's required. So when the water's not available, he would use the dust. If he's not able to stand in his prayer, he would sit. As I'm sitting here, I could perform my prayers right here. In fact, I've had to do that sometimes. And if a person is ill, if they're uh, in a certain situation where they're unable to stand, then they're able to sit and perform their prayers. Another important part of being a Muslim is fasting the month of Ramadan. But what if a person's not able to fast? They need to take medicines. What if there's something wrong with their stomach that they're not able to be away from food that long? What if, okay, in this case, they can make up for it? simply by waiting at a time when they are able to make up those days that they missed, or if they can't ever do it, then they can simply feed the people who are fasting and get the same reward. Hajj is another part of Islam. The pilgrimage, a person travels to Mecca once in the life. But what if they're unable to do so? What if they can't go? Some people might be incarcerated in a prison or something. They couldn't get away. They couldn't go. Or perhaps they're incapacitated some other way, unable to travel. Then the fact that they have the intention alone is sufficient for them. Many times we see things that happen in life that we're just physically unable to do the things that we desire to do. But if it's necessary to be a part of Islam, there's always these conditions. In Arabic, there's something called durura. Durura means that there is a difficulty. There is something that's an obstruction, something that is not normal. And then with that comes another word, ruksa. This is a concession or a permission that a person is allowed then to do something in its stead. An example here, when a person's traveling, it's difficult to perform their prayers according to the schedule because one of the things when you're traveling in an airplane, you're going through too many time zones too fast. Well, you can combine the prayers together and shorten them. And you can do it according to the time that makes it easy for you to work it out. All of these things are a part of the simplicity and the wholeness of Islam. So these books or scriptures that came with them are also simple to understand. Even today, we have the Qur'an in the Arabic language, and it's very simple for a person to spend a little time to learn the Arabic and begin to read. Although the Arabic language is very big, massive, powerful, it's still simple to begin and learn. The very easy teaching of the Arabic language makes it simple to get started. I personally was able to learn the basic of Arabic language in only six weeks and able to understand it within a few months. What we mean by this word simple is that every person has the opportunity, regardless of their mentality, to comprehend and put into their life this beautiful Islam, this submission and surrender to the will of the one, the one God. Now, coming back to this part of the simple message, this facet of Islam, the oneness of God, many books 
even volumes, perhaps even libraries, have dealt with what is called the Tawheed in Islam. The Tawheed is usually translated to English as monotheism. However, it's simpler than that if you want to go to the Arabic because it comes from the word wahid. Tawheed comes from wahid. And wahid means one. Simply one. The oneness of the God. See how simple it is. Each thing that we talk about becomes so simple. The words that are used in Arabic to represent the concepts and the teaching. When you look to them, you realize it's not that difficult. It's simple. The parables used in the Quran to help us to understand, again, are simple. The comparisons that we find, again, are simple. When Allah asks us to think, he asks you to look at things like mountains. That's pretty simple to do. Consider rivers. That's easy to do. Talks to us about things that are within our own hands, about ourselves, about our feelings, our emotions. Simple. Keeping it simple and straightforward. And all of this is just one facet of the many beautiful facets in Islam. When we talk about our relationship with others, again, in Islam, it's simple. Put the concerns and needs of the others in front of your own concerns and needs. Don't put yourself first. Put others first. Simple as that. And then you have grasped a very important part of Islam. And that is your relationship with other people. Because stop and think. If I'm trying to take care of someone else, they're going to appreciate that a lot more than if I'm in front of them trying to take care of myself and ignoring their needs. So again, it's simple. Each and every one of the facets that we've been presenting in our series, when you think about it, is really simple. And all of it together makes up the whole, the whole of the gem. And it's all held together in a real simple and beautiful way. Each piece fitting right beside the other piece and making it so that when you reflect and you think, it's simple. One of the things that we find in the Quran is that Allah constantly asks us to think, to reflect, to consider, to compare. He just asks you to think about it. I remember when I first started learning some of the words in the Quran that I realized there's patterns within the Quran. And when I see a certain pattern, I can almost guess what's going to come up next. And it's simple. Anytime it's talking about the people who disbelieve, you find the same structure of words. It's simple. When I find about those who do believe, again, there's a pattern. And it all simply comes together. And you understand that those who believe and do good works will receive appropriate rewards for that. Those who disbelieve and do evil will be punished. That's simple, isn't it? What a concept. There's no sin that's carried forward from one person to another. Another simple concept. If you did something, you're responsible. The people around you, if they didn't have anything to do with it, why would they be responsible? Why would your children inherit sin from you? In fact, in Islam, it's simple. You could be the best person, even though your parents could be evil, or your children could be bad. But still, you would be rewarded according to what you did or punished for any evil. There's a day of judgment. This is something else, very beautiful and simple in Islam. Each and every person will have to stand before their creator, before their Lord, and account for what they have done. This makes sense. It's simple. It also gives the balance that we need to know. That why? Why this person, he did this and he did that and he wasn't punished in this life. Another person who did so many good things, but look, they suffered in this life. But then on the day of judgment, all of these things come out. And then the one who had the hard life, the difficulty, yet they persevered, they were good. And of course, they submitted to God on his terms. This person would be rewarded. The other one, 
who did the evil, did the bad, didn't submit, denied, denied the favors of his Lord, then in the next life, he would suffer. Well, that makes sense. So now we start to begin to see other facets. We start seeing a facet called balance. We see another one that's called justice. We see other facets that come from this as well. And we understand now with this simplicity how it leads to its next door neighbor, a facet called peace. Because when there's simplicity and I can relax and say, yes, that makes sense. And then it does what? It allows my brain to be in peace. Another facet. All these facets working together, working together, bringing about a wholeness, a full and complete gem. And again, let's go back and look at the word. Islam also has this connotation of a wholeness, a completeness that comes along with the surrender, the submission, the obedience, the sincerity, and the peace. Each of these, another facet, major facets, all being connected together with this simplicity. So simplicity in itself is one of the many facets in Islam. If we relax our minds and our hearts and we just start to reflect on the very simplest things of life, reflect and then compare to what's being taught by the Creator Himself, go to His book and read it and think, what did He say? And then look about you and see, isn't that right? Isn't that simple? Isn't that clear? There was an occasion that happened to one of the prophets, the prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, that the people were worshiping these false gods, statues, and so on. And he went in to their temple when they weren't there and destroyed all of them with a big hammer. He left the hammer by the biggest of their statues, their big god. Then when he went away, the people came in and found all the destruction that had happened. And they were so upset, and they said, Oh, who did this? And they called him, because they'd heard he was upset with their gods. They called him, and he came and he looked. They said, What do you say about this? Look about you. What do you see? What do you say? He said, Why are you asking me? Why don't you ask the big god that you've got over there, that big statue? He's the one with the hammer. Ask him. And they were shocked. They said, Ask him? He can't hear. And he can't speak. And then he said to them, Then why do you worship him? Why do you pray to him? Why do you ask for him? You just said he can't hear and he can't speak. And they were astounded with this simple, easy logic. Why do you worship other than your creator when it's so simple right from the beginning? Listen to the message. Worship your creator, not that which he created. Simple? Simple. One of the beautiful facets of Islam. Oh.